Hey everyone, Dr. Mungli here. Previously, I have made a video on vitamin K and also I have explained in that video about the classic function of vitamin K or the well-known function of vitamin K and that is post-translational modification of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10 that are synthesized in the liver. The link for that video is available in the description below and also it is available at the end of this particular video. Now the purpose of this current video here is to explain what is the extra hepatic role of vitamin K in our body. Majority of the textbooks they just explain a vitamin K role in hemostasis that is post translational modification of vitamin K on fact, clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10. But we are, vitamin K has got lot more into that in, uh, in our body than just participating in hemostasis. What are all those functions? Before I get into the different roles of vitamin K uh, in our body, so let me quickly review different forms of vitamin K's that we get from the food. So all vitamin K's, they have got a single a common ring called manodione. They are all derivatives of manodione. Manodione has got oxygen in the first carbon as it is shown in the figure here. It has got oxygen in the first carbon and the fourth carbon. It has got uh, methyl group in the second carbon. Now vitamin K1 is phyloquinone. So as you can see in the figure, so phyloquinone has got phytol side chain in carbon number 3. Now, vitamin K2 is manoquinone. Now, the manoquinone, there are different kinds of, kinds of manoquinone. So, they are all having a phy, uh, the isoprenoid side chains at the carbon number 3. Basically, manoquinones, they are similar to phy, uh, phyloquinone. Only thing is, instead of phytol side chain, manoquinones have got isoprenoid side chains. So, depending on the number of isoprenoid units present in manoquinones, we have different types of manoquinones. We have manoquinone 4, manoquinones are just written as MKs. We have MK4, MK5, MK6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. They are all depending on how many isoprenoid units that they have. Now, once we consume a uh, plant source of vitamin K and that is phyloquinone. So the richest source of phyloquinone is coming from green vegetables. It can be leafy green vegetables or just green left vegetables. Just to name few, the highest source or the richest content of vitamin K1 phyloquinone. It is there in broccoli, it is there in kale, it is get there in spinach, it is there in collard, it is there in uh, lettuce. More greener the vegetable, so higher is the content of phyloquinone because phyloquinone is in association with chlorophyll. Now, once we uh, consume the green vegetables, so it is uh, phyloquinone is absorbed along with the lipids in our body and become part of chylomicrons. Now, the manoquinones which are coming from uh, animal derived fat like uh, eating cheese or anything that is fermented, so it has some amount of manoquinone. And also note that the bacteria present in our intestine, they will produce different types of, types of manoquinone and uh, majority of types of bacteria that will synthesize uh, vitamin K, that is K2, manoquinone, uh, they are all belong to bacterioid species and bifidobacterium. These are around 50% of anaerobic bacteria in our colon, they belong to bacterioids and uh, bifidobacterium and they will synthesize majority of types of manoquinones in that most of them are manoquinone 9, manoquinone 10 and some of them are manoquinone 7, 8, 12, something like that. So these manoquinones, they will be absorbed along with, so they will become part of chylomicrons. So phyloquinones along with the manoquinones, they, once they become part of chylomicrons, so chylomicrons are getting into lymphatics, from there they get into systemic circulation, and from the systemic circulation, so where the chylomicrons are converted into chylomicron remnants and chylomicron remnants are taken up by the remnant receptors which will recognize ApoE. ApoLife protein E will be present in chylomicrons, so remnants and they will be taken up inside the cells. Now what kind of tissues will express ApoLipoprotein E receptors or remnant receptors? So the remnant receptors, which are also basically referred as LDL receptor protein uh, like one, so or LRP1. 
So these receptors are uh, heavily expressed in the liver, but also note that uh, remnant receptors are also expressed in the osteo uh, bone, that is especially the osteoblast, they will express remnant receptors. Now what will happen to the uh, phylloquinone that is there or the manoquinones that is there in remnant receptors. Once the liver takes this uh, chylomicro remnant, so the things will be getting into the liver and in the liver, phylloquinone and also manoquinones, they will be loaded on to apolipoprotein B100 and that will become part of VLDL. Now your uh, vitamin K, it becomes part of VLDL. So it can be phylloquinone, it can be manoquinones. And VLDL, it gets into the circulation and in the circulation of VLDL, it will be broken down into IDL and IDL is broken down into LDL. You can watch my lipoprotein uh, metabolism video in, as in the description link below. Now, what will happen to LDL? So, now your phylloquinone and manoquinones, they are part of LDL. So, LDLs will be taken up by the LDL receptor by variety of extra hepatic tissues. And that's how your manoquinones and phylloquinones, they reach extra hepatic tissues. Now, what will happen to phylloquinone in the extra hepatic tissues? Majority of the phylloquinone, it has, been, it has been noted by recent research that majority of the phylloquinones are converted into MK4s and that is a manoquinone 4. So, as it is shown in the figure here, so the manoquinone 4, it has got a different iso means a number of isoprenoid units and the carbon 3. So, the manoquinone is the major uh, metabolic fate of phylloquinone in the extra hepatic tissues and manoquinone now it will participate in post-translational carboxylation of several molecules. Most of the phylloquinone that is there in the chylomicronaminate, so other than the liver, other than the liver, the next most organ that will take up chylomicron remnant in our body is the bone, especially the osteoblast. It will take up the chylomicron remnants and take that phylloquinone and the phylloquinone inside the osteoblast. It is converted into manoquinone and this can be occurring because of desaturation of the phytol side chain present in the phylloquinone into manoquinone. Now, the manoquinone that is MK4. MK4 is the one which is the major fate of phylloquinone in the osteoblast and MK4 is participating in the post-translational gamma carboxylation process. Now, uh, I have shown in the figure here, so post-translational gamma carboxylation done by gamma glutamyl carboxylase enzyme. So, it is going to translate, means uh, add carboxyl group to the glutamate residues especially the, uh, if it is going on in the blood vessels, it is clotting factor 2, 7, 9, 10. Whereas in the bone, it is uh, basically the osteocalcin. Osteocalcin in the bone is uh, post-translationally modifi uh, modified by adding a carboxyl group at the glutamate residues, which are basically referred as GLA residues. So, osteocalcin is uh, post-translationally carboxylated and the post-translational carboxylation of osteocalcin is an activated form of osteocalcin and furthermore, it is going to participate in mineralization process, hydroxyapatite crystal being added and it is going to increase the bone density. And also note that the other uh, proteins in the bone can also be modified in the presence of uh, MK4s or any other uh, uh, manoquinones and that is um, matrix GLA proteins, protein S. So, the other functions of the matrix glass protein, matrix glass proteins and protein S, it can be found in the vascular uh, smooth muscles. So, the vasculature, vasculature so the stability of the vascular, uh, vasculature and also the vascular repair and uh, uh, prevention of the calcification of the vascular tissue, it needs optimum amount of these uh, proteins, matrix glass, matrix glass proteins, protein S to be carboxylated. So, and that is helped by vitamin K mediated post translation gamma carboxylation. Now, how exactly vitamin K it is helpful in the bone formation? So, one of the hypotheses that has been postulated, uh, there are some papers on this particular process is uh, vitamin K, especially the MK4 uh, is going to decrease the production of prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin E2, by decreasing prostaglandin E2, it is going to decrease the pre-activation of osteoclasts and also vitamin K has been uh, noted in uh, decreasing the activation of cyclooxygenase whereby prostaglandin E2 can be decreased.
And also note that uh, vitamin K in the form of uh, phyloquinone which is further uh, converted into manoquinone 4 and also supplementation of uh, MK7, so they have been uh, noted to prevent um, osteoporosis in people who are uh, either uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis can be prevented or osteoporosis induced because of corticosteroid in intake can also be prevented by supplementation of uh, MK4s or MK7s. So one of the things that we really need to remember here is um, the hepatic function of uh, vitamin K, it is that, yeah, see the doses or the amount of vitamin K that is needed for hepatic uh, function of vitamin K, that is the, uh, the liver is going to synthesize clotting factor 2, 7, 9, 10 and the vitamin K required for uh, activation of clot, means uh, optimum synthesis of uh, clotting factor 2, 7, 9, 10 and also activation of these clotting factors in the blood. It needs a uh, very little quantity of vitamin K, whereas for bone to activate osteocalcin using this gamma carboxylation process, it needs high amount of vitamin K. That means uh, the under normal consumption of vitamin K or the normal regular uh, dietary doses of vitamin K, even if there is a little deficiency there, that is sufficient to maintain the activation of clotting factor 2, 7, 9, 10, but for mineralization process, bone mineralization process, more than optimum levels of vitamin K is needed because vitamin K concentration is um, means the absorption of vitamin K by the osteoblast is uh, much less affinity with the, much less affinity than the absorption of vitamin K by the liver. So these are some of the things. Uh, so that is why the supplementation of MK fours and MK sevens in prevention of osteoporosis have, has been widely studied now because osteoblasts have been shown uh, shown to uh, consume a lot of amounts of vitamin K, especially the MK4 formation, MK7 formation, all these. So they all been shown to prevent osteoporosis, increase the bone density and also in the blood vessels they have been shown to prevent uh, means, uh, uh, participate in vascular repair function and also prevent calcification of the blood vessels. Now, how these, this vitamin K is degraded in our body? So, vitamin K degradation, it will be, uh, uh, there will be omega oxidation and the beta oxidation process going on in vitamin K degradation process and vitamin K metabolites are mainly excreted out of our body through bile and also some of the vitamin K can also be, uh, can also be excreted out of our body through urine. Whenever there is a use of cumarin or warfarin, these are anticoagulants. So, cumarin or warfarin, what, what they do is they are going to inhibit an enzyme called vitamin K uh, epoxide reduct uh, reductase enzymes. Now, this vitamin K epoxide and reductase enzyme when it is inhibited, so it is going to divert the accumulated uh, vitamin K, that is the oxidized form of vitamin K, into more into the urine uh, than in the bile. So that is the difference here. So the excretion of vitamin K under normal circumstances it will be taken care by the excretion into the bile and also partly into the urine. Whereas when the warfarin and cumarins are used, so most of the vitamin K metabolite will go into urine rather than in the bile. And also note that prolonged use of vitamin uh, warfarin and cumarin can lead to uh, Bone, decrease in the bone density and risk of uh, fractures uh, in people using uh, constant use of uh, chronic use of warfarin and cumarin and that's because it decreases the overall quantity of vitamin active vitamin K thereby osteoblasts won't be able to con uh, uh, activate osteocalcin. Now coming to the other uses of vitamin K other than like it's most used in uh, post-translational modification, uh, post-translational carboxylation of fact clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10 and also as I explained the uh, use of vitamin K in bone formation. So other than these uses, so vitamin K has been involved in uh, prevention of oxidative damage to biomolecules. It has been proved to decrease the inflammatory process uh, it, can, it has been uh, shown to have a, a preventive effects on cancer, especially uh, liver cancer and um, uh, cancer of the colon. So vitamin K has also been implicated in the synthesis of sphingolipids. It has been implicated in uh, exocrine pancreatic function. 
So it means the vitamin K has got several functions in our body other than the classic functions that have been explained in the textbooks that is uh, uh, coagulation uh, process that is in the uh, hemostasis process and uh, in this particular video I have explained you the bone formation in uh, the effect of vitamin K on bone formation. So these are some of the functions of additional functions of vitamin K then the ones classic functions of vitamin K that is uh, hemostasis activation of platinum factors. I hope this video has helped you in understanding in depth more into vitamin uh, different functions of vitamin K and different forms of vitamin K. Thanks for watching and if you found this video useful so support this channel by giving a thumbs up or liking this video and also if you have any questions you can uh, put that question in the comment section below and I will uh, answer them as quickly as possible. Thanks again and see you in my next video.